Let's pray together. O oh God, our Savior, we thank You that You have carved out for us a hiding place, a place of safety, a refuge from the coming storm. That coming storm is Your own anger against sin, and, and we are perpetrators. We are the guilty. And that rock of refuge is your Son, who endured your wrath against our sin so that we might be safe. You, the judge, have provided a protection from your own justice for us. So we thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, for his death on the cross, where he himself endured infinite judgment against sin. Not his own, but the sins of all who would ever believe that we might be safe in you. We pray now as we look to your word to serious and sobering realities of future judgment coming to the earth. That you would work in our hearts what you please. That you would cause us to take refuge in Christ for any who do not yet have safety there for all of us to lose our grip on this world which is perishing and to cling to you and long for the day when you will be vindicated, when, rights, uh, when wrongs will be made right, one day when all sin will be put away, the curse will be reversed and even death itself will die. Help us in this by the power of your Holy Spirit as we sit under your word, in Jesus' name, amen. There are historical events in our world that are removed from us by some distance. We forget about them. We weren't there to experience them. They are, of course, recorded for us and we can read about them, but they perhaps seem so strange to our ears uh, that we lose sight there was a worldwide flood in Noah's day. And as we saw last week, that flood came about as a judgment of God against the interaction of the human race with the race of demons. We saw the corruption of humanity and Satan's attack on the seed line of the image bearers of God on the earth. And there was the historical event of God's crushing of the Tower of Babel. Men in direct rebellion against God decided to get together in self-aggrandizement and make their own way rather than fill the earth and subdue it. God came down to crush the tower. And then there was the historical event of the destruction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah where God rained down fiery sulfur on cities in judgment of their perversions. These historical events were supernatural judgments. They're not the kind of thing that happen every day. They were historical and miraculous. They left their mark on the earth. Those things are visible today. And they left their mark on the memory of humanity. We've sort of turned them into mythologies in our day. The kind of distant memories that don't feel like reality. At the time of the flood, the worldwide violence and corruption and involvement with the de demonic powers was immersed in a worldwide deluge. At the tower, the self-exaltation of man and the flagrant disregard of God's commands was crushed. And at Sodom and Gomorrah, the sexual perversions were judged by fire from heaven. When you think about our world today and its self-aggrandizement, the human race getting together again to rebel against God's commands. You think about the sexual perversion in our day. You, you think about the widespread collusion with demonic ideas and even demonic forces. We should not be surprised that God will once again bring about supernatural judgments. The kinds of things that we're not accustomed to. The kinds of things that don't happen every day. 
These were historical events. They will be historical events again. And we mistake God's patience with some sort of tolerance, uh, leniency. We forget about God's holiness, His justice, His holy goodness, which means that God will act. Our world is not getting better. In fact, it will get much worse. And heaven cries out against the injustices. We as humans often make the complaint, if, if God exists and He is good, why is there so much evil in the world? That is the critical, skeptical, hard-hearted question. The real question is, since God exists and since He is good, why is He so patient with my evil? That's the right question humanity ought to be asking. We've been studying the book of Revelation verse by verse, making our way through the future literal history of the earth. God's judgments against the earth dwellers. We find ourselves this morning in Revelation chapter 9. You can turn there in your Bibles. We see in the book of Revelation a series of end times judgments from God against the earth. There was a scroll sealed up with seals, seven of them. And as each seal was broken and the scroll unrolled, another judgment in the future will come upon the earth. The final seal announced seven trumpets. And each of these trumpets will pronounce another judgment to come on the earth. And the final trumpet judgment will unveil seven bowls. Bowls of the final outpouring of God's wrathful judgments against the earth. All of that, of course, precedes the return of Christ to the earth and the establishment of His kingdom for a thousand years. We find ourselves this morning in the second series of judgments, seals, trumpets, bowls, in the sixth trumpet judgment. Look at verse 13 and read along with me. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. One saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released, so that they would kill a third of mankind. The number of the armies of the horsemen was two hundred million. I heard the number of them. And this is how I saw in the vision the horses and those who sat on them. They had breastplates of fire and hyacinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses are like heads of lions. And out of their mouths proceed fire and smoke and brimstone. A third of mankind was killed by these three plagues, by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone, which proceeded out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents and have heads, and with them they do harm." The rest of mankind, who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent of the works of their hands, so as not to worship demons, and the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. This is a strange portion of our Bibles. Sobering, intriguing, terrifying. I want us to take three lessons from this sixth trumpet judgment. Three lessons that, that we must take away this morning as we read a text like this. And the first comes from the first three verses, verses 13 to 15. I, I want us this morning to observe the patience of a holy God. Observe the patience of a holy God. Look back at verse 13. A sixth angel sounded, and a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound to the great river Euphrates, and the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year were released. How long... Has God waited so far 
to unleash this judgment. Long time. A long history of rebellious humanity spanning all the way back to the Garden of Eden. How bad has the world gotten? The world is bad. And as we grow older, we sort of get curmudgeonly and and we think about the good old days. And we think it's getting worse now than it was when we were young. And maybe that's true. Maybe that's a matter of perspective. The world has been bad and has gone from bad to worse in waves over history. Think about all the vice lists in the Bible and the bad behavior in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we realize humanity is not much different than it's always been. Listen to Romans chapter 2 and Paul's description of the patience of God in a world of sin. He says, you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. Think about that for just a moment. Have you ever had a condescending attitude towards someone else? Assessed that what they did was wrong? We're all in this category, having judged others for their behavior. And God points his holy finger at us and says, we're all hypocrites. Verse 2, we know that the judgment of God rightly falls. That's a contrast. We judge each other wrongly so often. But the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice these things. Do you suppose, O man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and you do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or... Do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? Look at verse 5. But because of the stubbornness of your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and the day of revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds." What does Paul say? A day is coming when God will judge and it will be right. And when he does that, humanity will get what humanity deserves. And the fact that God has not been dispensing the judgment we deserve yet is a matter of not his badness, but his kindness, tolerance, and patience. So what do you do with that? Do you treat God's long-suffering patience as leniency? Hey, I'm getting away with stuff today. I guess God doesn't care. Look, there's a bunch of evil in the world. Everybody's getting away with stuff. God doesn't care. God's not good. There is no God. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That's the world's response. But God says the day is coming. His judgment will be right. His judgment will be timely. Solomon recognized this principle in Ecclesiastes 8.11. He, he noticed that because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the sons of men are given more fully to do evil. Right? You know this in your homes. Parents, when you're inconsistent with discipline... And little Johnny doesn't receive discipline for some infraction. He thinks to himself, ah, no big deal. I'll do more. Is he prone to think, I didn't get disciplined for that and I really deserved it. Oh, my dad is so kind and tolerant and patient. It's going to lead me to repentance. Now, what's bound up in the human heart? A trajectory towards evil and rebellion against God. And part of that evil is looking at God's patience and assuming he doesn't care. That's a bad bet. God indicted his people Israel in Isaiah 57, 11. He said, I was silent for a long time, so you don't fear me. Again, we mistake God's kindness for carelessness. Verse 13 we see this sixth angel sounding the trumpet of judgment against the earth dwellers. And what happens? 
John hears a voice from the four corners of the altar. Uh, probably a way to say from, from the middle of the altar, right in the center of this altar. This altar is the golden altar of incense in heaven. Uh, the voice here is probably not the voice of God. Uh, we know that because in chapter 16, 7, the voice comes from the altar again and addresses God. So it's probably not God speaking. It could be the angel that's associated with the altar back in chapter 8. We're not told what this voice is. We just get this sense that, that John heard this voice coming out of the center of this golden altar of incense. And this golden altar in heaven represents the prayers of God's people from all of history. You remember that when Christians pray, when, when believers offer up prayers to God, as, as weak and feeble and uninformed as our prayers may be, we pray in faith, those end up as precious commodities in heaven. It is a matter of worship before the Lord. And the Lord hears the voice of His people. Prayers don't go unheard. They are, in fact, treasured. And here, this treasury of prayer, of, of pleasing words that go up before God as a fragrant aroma from all of history. They've ascended for millennia. And you remember that Jesus taught his disciples to pray this May your will be done on earth, even as it is done in heaven. What does heaven resonate with but the holiness of God? Those four living creatures surrounding the throne cry out day and night, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. These are sinless beings hiding their faces, hiding their feet, and hovering over holy ground, crying out the abject holiness of God. The heavenly host understand holiness. And this prayer of incense serves as a regular reminder that God's people on the earth Sinners who are forgiven, who still live in a world of sin and sorrow, crying out to God that His will that is done up there would be done down here. It is effectively a cry for God's own vindication, for the Lord to have His day. This voice calls out from the very place where these appeals have gone up to God for thousands of years. You and I forget the goodness of God. I, I frankly think we don't understand holiness. We've never yet been free from the presence of sin. If, if you're a believer here today, you're forgiven of your sin. You will not face the eternal consequences of your sin. You're free from slavery to sin. You're, you're no longer a slave to your old corruptions. But you have not yet been eradicated of the presence of sin. And so... Sin feels sort of normal down here. And we just don't understand what holiness is. We don't truly understand what goodness is. You see, God's judgment against the earth in these judgments unfolding is not some irrational response, some, some reaction out of control to something He doesn't like. No, this is the controlled, appropriate outburst of good in the presence of sin unrepented. Heaven has not forgotten the holy goodness of God. And so the altar here is calling out that it's time for the earth to be judged. And look what this voice from the altar says in verse 14. Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the sixth trumpet angel sounds the trumpet, the altar speaks, commands the angel, and now that sixth trumpet angel has a task to release four angels. These four angels are said to be bound, and they are said to be bound in a location. Good angels are never bound in Scripture. I believe these are fallen angels. These are demons. These are demons who have been locked up in a location for a purpose. And they've been bound up at the great river Euphrates. You remember, as we've talked about angels and demons in the book of Revelation, these are spiritual beings. They can take on physical form, and they have done that in numerous points throughout world history. But they are intrinsically spiritual and invisible. They are principalities and powers in the heavenly realms. They are mostly unseen. And these four have been bound. 
You remember last week we talked about a, a whole host of evil angels that were locked up after sinning in Noah's era. 1 Peter 3.19 tells us that Jesus went and made proclamation to those spirits that are now in prison. 2 Peter 2.4 describes how they got there. God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. And then Jude 6 sort of alludes to their incarceration and then their purpose. The book of Jude, verse 6, says, Angels did not keep their own domain. They abandoned their proper abode. God kept them in eternal bonds under darkness unto the judgment of that great day. It's possible that Jude 6 reverse to this very moment. The fifth trumpet, when those demon locusts were released out of the pit to torment humans for five months but not kill them, and now in the sixth trumpet judgment to be released for even a more awful purpose. The fifth trumpet, those demons that were released, took the form of flying, stinging, scorpion-tailed war horses. They were not allowed to kill anyone, but they brought immense pain and suffering. This next judgment, called the second woe, will unleash a demonic horde with a different result. These four evil angels are said in verse 14 to be bound at the great river Euphrates. That is a, a mark of a region around the Euphrates River. It is a region that is significant as it relates to evil in biblical and world history. The region of the Euphrates was, of course, the origin of sin's entrance into the world in Genesis 3. It was the location of the first murders, vengeance, and polygamy in Genesis 4. It was the location of the rebellion at the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. And that region also gives us the first recorded warfare between nations in Genesis 14. And here it apparently will be the source of this outburst of evil angels as a judgment against humanity. Look at verse 15. And the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year were released. These four evil angels are said to be prepared that is prepared by God. They are placed and set in preparation for this moment and these evil angels have evil intent. And as we said last week, God has all evil on a short leash. He is sovereign. Nothing is out of His control. Can you imagine four evil angels bent on destruction, murderous at heart, pent up, awaiting for a moment to be let go for a time. They are prepared. This means God is orchestrating the judgment. And this is true throughout the Bible that God uses evil purposes by evil moral agents to accomplish his good ends. You, you can think about some of the illustrations of that in Genesis 50:20. Joseph, who was mistreated by his brothers, told them, You meant this for evil, God meant it for good. We think about Romans 8, 28, that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love Him, who are called according to His purpose. That all things includes bad things, evil things, sins. God uses them to accomplish good things for His people. Really is a remarkable demonstration of His sovereignty. One is truly in charge when you can make your enemies serve your purposes. And of course, the greatest example of this is the cross of Christ. In describing that, Peter described the evil intents of those who strung up Jesus. You, by evil men, planned this wicked deed, and God planned it from eternity past to bring about this good purpose, the saving of sinners. There's nothing new here in God using evil entities to accomplish His purposes. And notice they were prepared for the hour and day and month and year. In other words, this event comes down to a moment. These demonic forces have been locked up in preparation for this event, for this precise moment, and it is no accident. The book of Revelation is, is not God sort of prognosticating about what might happen. He is writing down for us what did happen in the future, if I can say it that way. 
This is locked up in the orchestration of God's sovereign plan. These evil angels are to be released at the precise hour, day, month, and year that God has planned. God is never late in His purposes, but He is slow to anger. He's very patient. Consider again how long God has waited since the fall of man. Probably six millennia of rebellion. How long has God waited since the flood? 4,000 years of patience with us. How long since the Tower of Babel? How long since Sodom and Gomorrah? And listen, the crimes committed at each of those supernatural judgments have been recommitted by humanity since. And our own world culture today is accelerating toward all of those in even greater degree. Listen to 2 Peter 3.9. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but He is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Think about the kindness of God toward His enemies. Toward the people who have their fist in God's face, who have said, my way, not your way. And God has not ended the world yet. He is so patient. I don't know if you've ever thought about your own life. What was my life like before I knew Christ? How many scrapes with death were there? Some that I would never know about. How did God intervene with my circumstances? to bring me to the gospel and give me life when I wasn't seeking Him. I wasn't looking for Him. I wasn't living for His glory. And He loved me. Listen, God still has that same heart. The world hasn't ended ended because there are still people whom God will bring to Himself in repentance. We might think Him slow. He's just patient. God always does what He does on time. There's a second lesson from this sixth trumpet judgment. You need to believe the promise of a terrible judgment. Believe the promise of a terrible judgment. Look at the last part of verse 15. They were released so that they would kill a third of mankind. And the number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. Verse 17 gives a very specific description of them. Verse 18 gives the description of the plagues that come from them and their power in verse 19. All of these details are here in Scripture to indicate that God is to be taken at His word. In the fifth trumpet judgment, the order was given not to kill. In the sixth trumpet judgment... License to kill is given. And notice the parties involved here. Verse 16, the number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. We haven't seen a 200 million man army assembled for war in history yet. We're not told where this infernal cavalry comes from. The four evil angels are let loose and what proceeds to fill the earth is a massive stampede of demon horses sent to unleash torment and murder on humanity. I don't think John could count to 200 million. He was told the number. Other places in the book of Revelation, we've seen an uncountable number. This one's counted, though probably not by John. He was told there were 200 million Notice the description in verse 17. This is how I saw in the vision the horses and those who sat on them. They had breastplates of fire and hyacinth and brimstone. The heads of the horses are like heads of lions, and out of their mouths proceed fire and smoke and brimstone. These are not ordinary horses. This is not a human army. This is not a normal cavalry. These are supernatural beings. Notice the riders here are barely mentioned. 
the writers have no weapons. You don't hear about guns or, or swords or spears or anything like that in the hands of the writers. All the weaponry, all the destructive power is with the horses. This is striking. In fact, the grammar probably locates the breastplates on the horses or maybe on the horses and the riders, uh, but not just the riders. And those breastplates are colored in the color of fire and hyacinth and brimstone. Uh, Fire has its normal red-orange colors most likely. Hyacinth is a blue color, uh, maybe a, a smoky periwinkle if we can get Crayola crayon specific. And then brimstone is sulfur. It's that yellow stone. And sulfur, when it's burned, emits a very hot blue flame and smoke. This triad of description is the description of God's fiery judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. We read in Genesis 19 that brimstone and fire fell from the sky and destroyed those cities. If you can imagine giant globs or lumps of sulfur on fire, burning and melting and raining down onto the earth. Around the Dead Sea today, you can still find brimstone in round globs on the earth. And these globs of sulfur, you can light on fire and they will burn and they will melt and emit a hot blue flame and smoke. We see this same triad in Revelation 14. Turn over there for a moment. This is a description of eternal torments. In describing those who during the tribulation take the mark of the beast, God says, He will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in the full strength in the cup of His anger. And He will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Get to Revelation 20 and verse 10. The same description is there of fire and brimstone. What's going on in this sixth trumpet judgment is a preview of eternal judgments. And we haven't left yet the patience of God. If God's patience had run out, there wouldn't be this judgment. There would just be all remaining sinners cast into the lake of fire. God still has purposes, as we will see in the book of Revelation, to save some. This fire and brimstone language looks back to the past at real historical supernatural judgments on the earth. And it looks forward to real historical future events of judgment in eternity. These horses are said to have heads like lion's heads. And you get the picture of the king of beasts, ravenous with giant fangs. But again, these are not normal creatures. These lions don't eat. They're not even described as tearing flesh with their teeth. Instead, we discover that out of their mouths proceed fire and smoke and brimstone. It is lake of fire torment coming out of their faces. In an interesting irony, in Isaiah 31.3, God's people Israel were looking to Egypt for protection against their political enemies. God said, trust me, and they said, we can't see you, therefore we don't trust you. We're going to go get mercenary help from Egypt. They have lots of horses. We'll trust their armies. And God's response to them in Isaiah 31 was, their horses aren't spiritual, they're just flesh. In other words, they're nothings. God can take care of that. And the ironic turn here in this judgment is, these horses are not flesh, they are spirit. Evil spirits. Demonic. Look at verse 18. A third of mankind was killed by the three plagues, fire, smoke, and brimstone proceeding out of their mouths. We don't know what the population of the earth will be during this time period, but if we project the current population of the world into this scene of the Great Tribulation, we would start with 8 billion, approximately. 
under the fourth seal judgment, we learned that a quarter of the earth was killed. Chapter 6, verse 8. And now a third of what remains will be killed. If during the fourth seal, a quarter of eight billion were killed, that would be two billion killed on the earth in one judgment, leaving six billion. And if six billion remained by the time you get to the sixth trumpet judgment, a third of them would be killed, another two billion, leaving four billion on the earth. That is half the world's population killed in just these two end times plagues. It's staggering. You can look around a room like this and count every other person. Gone in judgment. This depicts real physical death. This is not some symbolism for the scourge of ideas or something else. This is a real judgment accomplishing real things with real people on the earth. And what happens after death for those judged by God in this way? Not annihilation, uh, not uh, going out of existence. Uh, there is no second chance. There is no purgatory where you go to some sort of middle ground and get cleaned up for a while until you get out. There's no, nothing temporary. After death, there is no more patience from God. No more opportunities to repent. The book of Hebrews tells us it is appointed for man to die once and then to face judgment. And in the sixth trumpet judgment, those who are killed by the plague of the demonic cavalry die and then face judgment. Death is not a reprieve. Death is not a release from suffering. Death is the entrance into eternal suffering. This is very serious. Look at verse 19. John describes the power of the horses in their mouths and in their tails. Their tails are like serpents and have heads, and with them they do harm. Can you imagine a horse with a Medusa tail running around the earth? And the tails have power to torment humans. They bring pain and, and, and torture while what comes out of the mouths kills. These are fire-breathing horses with snake-head tails. It's a terror out of a nightmare, out of a horror movie. Frankly, it's, it's hard to depict, hard to even contemplate. We looked a little bit at demons last week. Let's take a moment and get a little more background biblically on demons. You need to understand that demons are not departed souls. They're of a different class of creature than humans. Just as angels are not graduated humans who believe, demons are not graduated humans who didn't believe. Demons and angels are of the same class. Spiritual, angelic beings created before humans. They were there and present during the week of creation. Biblically, they are called sons of God and they have had interaction on the earth various times in human history. They are spiritual and invisible normally. Demons are a class of angels. They are fallen angels. They are angels who sinned. They followed Satan in rebellion against God. As such, they are enemies of humanity. They interact in the physical realm at times, and they interact in the realm of ideas. Last week, we saw one of the ways they have interacted in the physical realm, and in a very gross and a, a perversion of the sexual union to interfere with the seed line. We saw that in Noah's day. But demons also interact in the physical realm in other ways, and we saw this during the earthly ministry of Christ. When God the Son came to earth and preached good news, Satan unleashed hordes of demons in Palestine, in the land around where Christ was. It was as if Satan knew the war was on when Jesus was present on the earth. And so when you read the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and even in the early portions of the book of Acts, you encounter people who are demon-possessed. Uh, the Greek word is simply demonized. 
Judas was indwelt by a demon in order to betray Jesus. And Jesus interacted with people who were indwelt by demons. One man was indwelt by a legion of demons. And you remember the scenes of a a young boy foaming at the mouth and throwing his own body into the fire because he has been taken over by one of these evil spirits. Or a woman bent over double, unable for decades to stand up straight because of a demon. Epileptic seizures and, and other manifestations in the physical realm caused by these evil spirits. And when Jesus was on the earth, it is like the whole demonic world lit up in physical interaction. There was a war. Jesus cast out demons and he commanded his disciples during his earthly ministry to cast out demons. Why did he do that? Well, one of his messages was the kingdom of God is at hand. Meaning the king himself who rules the kingdom that's coming was on the earth. And everywhere that Jesus went, the kingdom was there because he was there. And so diseases were eradicated. Demons fled. Do you remember it was the demons in people that would call out, I know who you are. You're the son of God. Have you come to torment us before the time? They were afraid of him. They knew his power. Sometimes it was only the demons that got Jesus' identity right. Nobody else knew who he was. So Jesus gave authority to his disciples to cast out demons in his name while he was here. What does that depict? It it depicts the kingdom that's still coming. When Jesus left, the nearness of the kingdom left in the sense of its proximity to the earth. Its imminency remains. That kingdom can come on God's timetable. And what will happen during that thousand year reign of Christ? We read in Revelation 20 that Satan, and I think by implication all of the demons, will be locked up. That strong angel will come with a giant chain and grab that devil, that Satan, that serpent of old, and lock him in the abyss for a thousand years. He will no longer be able to deceive the nations. Right now, Satan is a roaring lion roaming the earth seeking someone to devour. And his agents, his demons, are involved. Are those agents, those demons involved in the physical realm still today? Uh, Of course, there was a big flare-up during Jesus' earthly ministry. Does it still happen today? Yes, I believe it does. Demon possession is a reality in our day. Demon possession is a reality around the world in various cultures. Uh, By the way, what should you do if you ever encounter a demon-possessed person? Preach the gospel. When someone is in their right mind, preach the gospel. That's the only liberation from demonization. A demon cannot cohabit where the Holy Spirit dwells. Christians cannot be demon-possessed. Preach the gospel and you'll see freedom. But demons are very real. I don't believe in our Western civilization that demons are taking on the kinds of physical manifestations we see in the gospel. Listen, they don't need to. There is a more subtle trickery at play. But physical involvement still happens today. Demons interact not only in the physical realm, but significantly in the realm of ideas. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. We mentioned last week from Ephesians 6 that our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual powers, the principalities, the dark forces at work in the heavenlies. These dark forces don't always, perhaps don't often, show up in physical manifestations, but interact in the realm of ideas. 1 Timothy 4 gives us a window into this. The Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Okay. You you see an invisible spiritual being telling you something to believe. Run away. 
But that's not the means by which it happens according to this text. Uh, Demons speaking directly to humans. Notice what Paul says about it, verse 2. By means of the hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. Where do these doctrines of demons come? They, they come in religion. They come in teachings taught by men, false teachers. The realm of idea comes with men whose consciences are seared. They're not on short accounts with God. They've actually made friends with sin. And you need to know that sinful lives of teachers go along with demonic activity and false teaching. These things hold, these things hold hands. How do demons get their ideas to humanity? Under good-sounding disguises. Satan himself parades as an angel of light. And so demons don't get a lot of traction in our day by saying, I'm of the evil horde, I want to destroy you and kill you. They get more traction by saying good, sweet things that tickle the ears and attract the idolatries of our own hearts. This is the means by which demons interact with us today significantly. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Sometimes I think we go Hollywood when we think about demons. And we think about exorcisms and supernatural encounters. But we need to be much sharper than that. Listen to 2 Corinthians 10. Beginning in verse 3. Although we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. What fortresses are you talking about? We are destroying speculations, thoughts, ideas, and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So listen, we're in a war. And it's not with physical implements. And it's probably not often with physical manifestations of demonic activity. But with the ideological manifestations of demonic activity, deceptions, worldviews, ideas. And these things govern the world. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Again, the realm of ideas. A third lesson from this sixth trumpet this morning is a little bit more personal. Beware the danger of a hardened heart. Think about your own heart. Think about your own response to the seriousness of God's holiness the awfulness of sin, the promise of coming judgment. What is that doing in you right now? Listen, you you might be tempted to think, well, that's, I mean, that's words on a page. It's, It's in the future. Even if it is real, it's not real to me right this moment. You need to understand that when it is very real to the people being inflicted by a demonic horde of evil cavalry, they will not respond with wisdom. They will not respond with rationality. They will, in fact, be hard-heartedly insane against their own best interest. Look at verse 20. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent. They did not repent of the works of their hands, so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. When it all goes down, there's not a change of heart for the majority of humanity. They will know what's happening. 
They will be terrified by what is happening and they will say, you can have my sin when you pry it from my cold, dead fingers. What an awful place to be. In fact, several times in the book of Revelation, this same mindset happens. It's just shocking when you read these judgments. Revelation 16, 9, men were scorched with fierce heat and they blasphemed the name of God who has the power over the plagues and they did not repent so as to give him glory. Chapter 16, verse 11, they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and they did not repent of their deeds. Listen, don't think that you can stiff arm God now and have a soft heart later. It doesn't work that way. And look at the vice list here. You get these warnings and sometimes you think, uh, yeah, the, the Bible says there's a bunch of dirty deeds, don't do those. Um, it's like the Santa Claus myth. I um, hope I didn't blow any surprises there. Um, be good because somebody's watching and it's sort of an adult scare tactic to get kids to stay in line. Have you ever heard the Bible described that way? Maybe the doctrine of hell put forward that way? Oh, that, that, that's just for, for weaklings who need some negative incentive to do what's right. Uh, this, is, this is reality. These warnings are not from fuddy-duddies of a bygone era who are killjoys that just don't want you to have any fun. The vice list here gives us a worldwide normalization of things God hates. God's been very patient. Humanity has stored up wrath against itself for the day of God's wrath. But one day, God's righteous judgment will be released. I was reading a book this week written in the 1870s, written by a pastor who was describing the, the moral bankruptcy of his day. This is the 1870s. And he said, we're entering an era of free love where it seems like marriage doesn't matter anymore. I think the whole idea of marriage is going to be broken down altogether. 1870s. He said, We've, homicides are normal. You, you read about murder in the papers every single day and it just sort of becomes the way of things. We, we get used to it. He said, mothers kill their infants. And then he described feticide or abortion. He said, what is the world coming to? And we might think 1870s, man, it was great back then. It was America. We were upstanding or whatever. Humanity's humanity. You read about the church at Corinth and, and the kinds of moral atrocities that that church faced in its city. There's nothing new under the sun. But when you think about what's happening in our world now, there is sort of a global camaraderie in the vice list that we see in this group. We have to think that when this goes down, when Revelation 9 happens, it won't be a far cry from what we're seeing today. John records the rest of mankind who were not killed by the plagues did not repent. That word repent just means a change of mind with a resulting change of life. You change your thinking about what's right and what's wrong. You turn away from idols and turn to the living God. Your life then follows where your mind just changed. Repentance is a 180 degree turn. They did not repent. What did they not repent of? Of the works of their hands. That is, thinking materialistically, worshiping the things that they'd made. Think about that as human beings made in the image of God, we create, not in the sense of making everything out of nothing, but in the sense of rearranging God's materials into other things that we can use. We can be creative even if we don't speak things into existence. An artist takes paints and dyes and a canvas and makes something that has never existed before. But what does sinful man do with the works of his own hands? adores them, worships them. And the great irony of that, seen in the great passage in Isaiah where the, the guy cuts down a tree, carves a piece of it into an idol to worship, uses the other part of the wood to make a fire to bake his bread. And the whole thing is just stupid. 
The, the insanity of idolatry is amazing and it is bound up in the human heart. And notice he says they, they worship the works of their hands and they worship demons and the idols of gold and silver and wood and brass and stone. Those things can't see, don't walk, can't talk. You think about the idol maker, also depicted in the book of Isaiah, who makes his idol and sets it up on the mantle in his home. And then he puts food in front of it. And then he has to actually dispose of the food because the idol didn't eat it. And he puts more food up in front of it. And we think, oh, that's so silly. Those ancient peoples, they did those idolatry things. In most of the world today, people still do this very thing with actual carved idols. We've normalized idolatry. And whether it's idols that are physical images or some non-physical entity that we, that we love more than God, idolatry is a heart issue. But I'm amazed that idols have made their way into Bible-based religious expression. It wasn't very long after the New Testament that so-called Christians started to venerate images. And if you've been in a Coptic tradition or Eastern Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, or Roman Catholic, you understand there are venerated images and statues and sculptures everywhere. I think you should all go visit Israel on one of the Israel trips that we'll do someday if that war ever ends. But one of the great tragic realities you need to be warned about is walking through Israel and watching people worship the, the ground that Jesus walked on or some piece of some relic of something and they bow down and they kiss and they pray to it. It's all stuff. And all of that comes into Christendom and it is idolatry. And then of course the rest of the world has their physical representations of deities. They make them, they bow down to them. A number of years ago, Scott Demarest and I actually walked into an idol factory in Tibetan China, a place where people were making gods to be purchased and taken home and fed and worshipped. There is environmental idolatry. You know, the... the the haters that hate people but love their dog, where they've elevated pets to the level of image bearers and actually hate humanity. That's backwards. It's an idolatry. The worship of the environment is a violation of Romans 1. They worshiped and served the created thing rather than the creator who is forever praised. And they made images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. This is the reason God's wrath is coming. What an offense to a holy God that we would take what He has made, make it with our own hands, and then live for it. And, and you're thinking, yeah, I, I'm more sophisticated than that. I, I would never do such a thing. And we make an idol out of money, and sex, and relationships, and power, and position, and work, and leisure, we make an idol out of not having children. There's a phenomenon now, two income, no kids. It's a great way to live. And then we make an idol out of having children. You can make an idol out of not being married, an idol out of being married. You can make an idol out of sinful things, not of good things. Anytime we love something more than God, we have become idolaters. Anytime we rewrite God in his definitions and descriptions and make him other than he is and worship that, We've become idolaters. The human corruption is an idolatry at heart. John Calvin famously said the human art is a factory of idols. We just produce and produce and produce. And these, in the face of such clear judgments from the one true God, will not repent. And they don't repent of their murders that is, murder has become so normalized that it's almost an entitlement. It certainly is that in our day. We don't have the death penalty hardly anymore. 
We don't value the image of God and follow his commands in that regard. Murderers get out and they repeat. And of course, we've normalized murder for convenience in the abortion clinic. Infanticide is growing in acceptability. Euthanasia is growing in its acceptability. John says he did not report, uh, repent of their sorceries. Sorceries is the Greek word pharmacone. We get our word pharmacology, pharmaceuticals. Uh, there is an overlap between the worship of the demonic world and the involvement of mind-altering drugs. In fact, the, the witch doctors would use mind-altering drugs as an entrance point into the world of spiritual darkness. And so this word for sorceries in your Bible refers both to drugs and demons. And you think about our world today. This is so normalized. Superstitions are normal. Charms and curses are normal. Enchantments are entertainment. Ouija boards are a game. Seances and tarot cards and palm readings and psychics. This is just part of our culture. There are TV shows devoted to talking with the dead, communicating with the other side. I was in eighth grade and had a substitute teacher in my biology class, and the substitute teacher didn't teach biology, told us to put our heads down on her desk and to just not think for a while, clear the mind. And then the substitute teacher introduced us to spirit guides, inviting him and his friends to take us to a, a new world of exploration and discovery. I thought it was a little weird. I told my dad and he, <laughs> he was on the ceiling. <laughs> of course, here in Arizona, we have our new age vortices, crystals, enneagrams, astrology, all of that stuff just becomes normalized. Playing with the dark side. And of course, drug use is epidemic. Psychedelic drugs, hallucinogens, some looking for escape, some unintentionally finding their way through corridors into dark spiritual worlds, others intentionally looking for those corridors. Drugs used to increase sensuality, to give access to the spiritual realm. We use drugs nowadays to reverse the effects of reckless immorality. You sin and there's some physical consequence Instead of turning to God, hey, there's a drug for that. All of this opens the door to spiritual darkness. They don't repent of their immoralities. The word there is pornea. We have normalized premarital sex, extramarital sex, deviant sex. People engage in lust and the commercialization of sex and the pornography industry is everywhere all the time. These things make the list because God hates them. And you see the corrupt heart of man that will not let them go even in the face of eternal torment. I'd rather have this fleeting pleasure than have forgiveness and life in God. And they did not repent of their thefts. And it's just so fun to steal. Think about the, the kleptomaniac used to be a psychological disorder. And now it's an entitlement. Have you seen in the news the, the people that loot and steal and say, this is reparations. This is what I'm owed. And our government says, yeah, yeah, that's right. In fact, we won't prosecute thefts anymore up to this amount or that amount, or maybe not at all, and people flee cities. It's just becoming so normal. All of this, of course, be, become not only entitlements, but entertainment. And then the world is full of the white-collar corruption. People line their pockets with ones and zeros somewhere in the internet and find a way to steal from others in ways we don't know. Your parents may have warned you about all of these things. I hope they did. I hope you parents warn your kids about them. Now, why do parents warn their kids? Well, it's because they're old and they don't know how to have fun. They've never, they've never been where you are. 
They don't see the world before them of all the opportunities for pleasure and delight. The reality is your parents warned because they were young. They have the same corruptions internally and they entertained the same ideas, same temptations, and they have discovered where these roads lead. These pleasures never deliver on their promises. And you and I reading this text understand something truly grave. God hates these things. And he has pent up his wrath against them like a great dam holding back water. And someday he will let all of that go. And the wrath that we have stored up against ourselves as a human race will be unleashed. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. The condition of our world today is no surprise to God. It should be no surprise to us. Sometimes we we hanker for the good old days and we think that the next election will turn it around. That's a misplaced hope. Listen to 2 Timothy 3. Realize this. In the last days, difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they've denied its power. Look down at verse 13. Evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. What is the message for us? You, however, continue in the things you've learned and become convinced of. Stay close to the Word of God. Christian, you're not in the Great Tribulation yet, but you are in a war, a spiritual war, against principalities and powers, invisible forces of darkness. We need to be acute and thoughtful and be renewed in our minds clinging to the Word of God, different than the world. Let's pray. Oh Lord, our enemy is powerful, intelligent. His craft and power are great. He is armed with cruel hate. On earth is not as equal. We affirm Martin Luther's words about Satan and demons. Those invisible powers with which we war, which we most often do not see, but are very real. We know there is a day coming when that reality will be visible to the entire world and en masse the world will still not repent. God, we thank you for the opportunity now because of your great patience your desire to save, that we are here. Those of us who know you, who have embraced the gospel, have already experienced a transformation and a transfer from the dominion of darkness and the dominion of light. And those who are here this morning who have not yet repented are still being given opportunity to believe and to be saved. We pray even now that today would be a day of salvation for them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm.